Hello, and welcome to I Am Dad podcast with your fatherhood authority, Kenneth Braswell. 30 minutes of wisdom, information, resources, and nuggets on your fatherhood journey. Or maybe you're just curious and want to hear some real talk about fatherhood, family, and the minds of men. Well, guess what? We got you too. Sit back, grab your pad and pen, and maybe even bring a little something to sip on. Enjoy 30 straight minutes of fatherhood, family, and fun with the fatherhood authority, Kenneth Braswell. Welcome to I Am Dad Podcast. I'm your host, Kenneth Braswell. Thank you for joining us another Sunday morning or whenever you happen to be locking in to the podcast, whether you're on a social media platform, a podcast platform, or YouTube, um, we just thank you for showing up and you are showing up in our numbers. Our numbers are continuing to increase. I talked last week about how we celebrated our 100th episode. Um, I'm really proud of that because I've said this several times before. I never thought that I would be doing this this long. I thought it would be a fad for me. I would do it and then kind of move on. But it's been so inspirational talking to people, you know, around the country as it relates to responsible fatherhood and family paradigms. And so and then we also surpassed um, 10,000 plus downloads um, a couple of weeks ago. In fact, we're closing in on 13,000 now. So folks are really, you know, paying attention, here's what I would ask you to do. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. No matter what channel you're on, please subscribe because that tells me, you know, that we have consistent listeners, that people are coming back and I can be able to corral our analytics so I could tell a full story about who is responding to I Am Dad podcast. And so we appreciate each and every one of you. We ask for you to like, share, and subscribe. Those are the only things that uh, I would like for you to do. And so today, you know, we welcome and we're honored to have a dedicated and passionate advocate for fatherhood and family services, Mr. Lamar Henderson. Lamar is the Family Services Supervisor for Merced County Human Service Agency's All Dads Matter program, where he has spent the past 20 years empowering men on their journey throughout fatherhood. His unwavering commitment to supporting fathers has made a significant impact in his community and beyond. Through his work, Lamar has helped countless men gain access to vital resources and knowledge, ensuring that they have the tools they need to be the best best fathers they can be. In addition to his role at All Dads Matter, Lamar is a seasoned parenting educator, facilitating programs such as parenting, positive discipline, and boot camp for new dads. He's also a certified trainer in trauma-informed approaches, including the Adverse Childhood Experiences ACE Overcomers Program and Helping Men Recover. His expertise has been invaluable in supporting men who have experienced trauma, guiding them toward healing and recovery. Lamar's influence extends beyond his local community as a trainer for UC Davis School for Human Services and Fresno State University Central California Training Academy. He has led workshops on working with fathers in child welfare, employee development, and anti-racist practices. His contributions to fatherhood research has been recognized by local, state, and national levels, and his work has been published in respected journals. Lamar has shared his insights on numerous platforms, including as a feature panelist for the National Response to Fatherhood Clearinghouse and as a keynote speaker for various fatherhood and family conferences. His dedication has earned him well, and he is well-deserved, including his inaugural Hands-On Hero Award and the President's Award for Service. We are excited today, ladies and gentlemen, to bring into the space my good friend Lamar Henderson. How you doing, sir? What's up, Kenneth? How you doing, my man? I'm doing good, man. I can't complain at all. Like they say, with a good space hand, I can't call it. I'm just going to roll. I'm going I'm to rock with my partner. We're going to see what we do. Okay. <laughs> run that Boston. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, yeah, we're going to run that Boston today. That's what we're going to do. Um, Lamar, we start our, um, our podcast off with um, a icebreaker, you know, that allows our audience to be able to tell a little more about the person that they're listening to. And that icebreaker is, tell us your daddy story. You can frame it however you want to frame it. Um, it's your guardrails. It's your, how you see it, how you want to tell it. We just want to know what your daddy story. Okay. My daddy story is, um, is uh, wonderful, I think. 
uh, amazing. I am a father of two. Um, my wife and I, we have a 34 year old daughter and we have a 26 year old daughter and a nine year old, soon to be 10 year old granddaughter. Um, been married for 33 years, uh, 34 in October, should she agree to the new terms of the contract. Um, you know, had an amazing father of my own, a committed and dedicated father of my own who loved being a family man. <clears throat> he modeled to me how to enjoy being a father how to cherish being a husband, how to cherish being a father and a grandfather. And so um, that's something that I definitely take into my practice uh, when serving fathers in my community. Um, mm -hmm. In regards to like my fatherhood story, I feel like, um, you know, as much as, as I have been to my children and in their lives, I think that it's multiplied in multitudes by who they've been in my life mm -hmm. and how they've given me um, the ability. There's things that I do for them that I would never do for myself before they were here. Wow. You know? And so um, it's created some buoyance for me, uh, helps me, my compass to, to point due north. And when I'm off, I can always make my way back. <laughs> so, yeah, that's my fatherhood story. Nice, nice. Thank you for sharing that. The other thing that I like to talk about is inspiration. 20 years in the game, bro. You've been in the game 20 years. Yeah. And I think oftentimes people who are new to the game, new to this work, are very curious about how we got to where we are, how we got to doing what we are doing. What was the inspiration and the journal for you into this work? You know, um, when I think about my, my journey into doing this work, um, I, it really allows me to reflect back on even my childhood and the role that my father played in my life. And um, I, I can reflect um, very clearly a moment where I can say I became a fatherhood advocate. Mm -hmm. And so I was probably about 15, maybe 16 years old. And I was riding in the, in the car with my father and my mom. And my mom's friend who was going through a divorce and I, I was sitting in the back seat with her. And, you know, we were raised in that era where, you know, kids don't get in grown folks business. <laughs> you know, if they're talking, you just be quiet and mm -hmm. you don't even listen to what they're saying. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they were kind of talking about, um, you know, the situation with the divorce. And um, within, the, within that conversation, um, either my mother or, or my mom's friend made the comment. Girl, you know black men ain't you know black men ain't s mm -hmm, black mm -hmm. ain't dead. and that struck something in me. And Junior spoke up, and um, I couldn't just sit there and let her make that comment with my father sitting right there in front of me. Mm -hmm. And so I said, "How can you say that in front of my father when my dad is sitting right there? He's a black man and a black father. You know how can you say that?" Mm -hmm. And a hush came over the car, you know, like what, you know, you don't speak, you don't speak when adults are speaking. And so, uh, um, my father jumped in like, well, Junior, they wasn't talking about me, you know, and this is not your business. And so, um, it was that courageous moment where I spoke up, uh, for fatherhood and I spoke up for my father and the tens of millions of black fathers in this country who are doing absolutely and everything they possibly can to be the best father they could possibly be for their children. And so that is really my passion and my journey now is telling that story. You know, um, it seems to be that um, in this story, so many times we focus on those fathers that are struggling or those deficit driven data and information. When I'm like, well, there is actually hundreds of millions of amazing fathers whose stories need to be told as well. It may not get you funded, but those are the stories we need to be telling. We need to aspire, you know, young, young people and young men and young fathers to embrace what, it, what, what fatherhood does for you, you know, um, and let that be the selling point as opposed to, you know, trying to give and shame somebody into doing something. Mm, yeah, that's an incredible story, bro. And I love to hear um, those things that motivate, you know, many of the leaders you know, around the country that's doing this work that will spark 
by something that happened in their lives that made them or encouraged them to use their voice specifically for men and more um, specifically for dads. And in my case, in many spaces, even more specifically for black dads, because a lot of that stuff is layered in terms of how people see men and then how they see fathers and then based on race, <clears throat> how do they see them on those spaces? One of the things that I had the pleasure of doing in my career early on was to come out there and visit you guys in California. Yes, I never forget yes. um, that trip coming out there and the things that I learned and the things that I saw and I got to see you um, in your space and I got to see the way that particularly your county was engaged in the work of responsible fatherhood where many counties around the country, you guys were trailblazers in that space. Um, doing what you were doing. And one of the things I walked away with and was so inspired, I think I still have that picture today. And that is seeing uh, all dads man a car sitting outside oh, yeah. in the front. Yes. And I was like, yes. yo, I got to have one of those. That's <laughs> dope right like, there. Yeah. It took me some years to get it, but I got my van right now. I nice. got my fatherhood is brotherhood van. Nice. Um, but you were the spark and inspiration to do that because it was so, I didn't understand what it meant to have that then, but I understand what it means to have it now when you're driving down the road and people are honking their horn at you yes. with their thumbs yes. up and yes. you see people taking pictures of the side of the van to get the telephone number or the email address, right. you know, or you see folks, you know, just you know, saying something at the light and asking for how to get in touch with you. And so it was such a cool thing to do. Yes. A lot of folks, and then your community looks very different than many other communities across the country. Talk to me about Merced County and the makeup and of what and the fathers that and families that you serve in California. Well, Merced County sits right in the middle of the state of California in the Central Valley in the uh, San Joaquin Valley. It's a um, rural community. Um, it's a, um, a county of a lot of agriculture, um, 51 plus percent Hispanic, um, um, very low number of African-American residents. That number is kind of decreasing with our kids growing up and going to college and move on. Probably it used to be 9%. It might be at 7 now. Um, high poverty rate. High, a lot of socioeconomic challenges. Um, education level, we're averaging about high school education level or lower. Um, you know, a lot of folks who are um, underemployed, you know, or, or multiply employed, mm -hmm. not to make ends meet, but to get them to see each other, you know. But what I love and appreciate about this county is that um, we are passionate about families. You know, there's a strong connection to family. Um, there's a strong connection to community. And even though I'm a transplant in Mercer County, I arrived here in like 1985. Um, this is definitely home for me. Mm -hmm. And um, it's one of one of the things that I appreciate about this community is that um, I feel that I live in a community where I can make a difference, where um, as an individual, I can apply whatever gifts and talents that the good Lord has blessed me with to improve and in betterment of my community. Uh, and it's, it's even more profound that I'm blessed to do that by working through, with families through fathers. And so uh, that's, that's Merced. Yeah. And it's so similar, you know, the conversation I was in this earlier this year was in San Bernardino um, County for a site visit out there and their community is similar, you know, and it's always interesting. Me and uh, one of my coworkers went out to provide some um, TA. And like many places I go to, you know, I'm always in search of the hood. I want to see where people live. I don't want to yeah. see how people live. And so we were able to kind of scoot around San Bernardino and see, you know, some of the community that looks exactly like you described in Merced County. And so Javin said to me, yo, he was like, if we really want to see the county, you know where we need to go, right? And I was like, where? He said, Walmart. And I was okay. like, oh, word. Yeah, yeah we got to yeah. go to Walmart. <laughs> and so we head on over to Walmart in um, San Bernardino. And what we saw was exactly what you just described. It's this whole 
um, ecosystem of families, right? And so, and typically in the Walmarts, there's single moms. You might see a couple of dads moving around um, and, and, and looking like that. But almost everybody we saw come into that Walmart came in as a family. The, 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 the boyfriend or husband was with her, the wife or girlfriend, and the kids, you know, were with them. You know, and I think that's an untold story, you know, as it relates to the Latino population. And so right. we often talk about this work from an urban perspective, right? But we don't get a, a chance to hear what it looks like from the rural perspective, perspective and then what it looks like from the Latino perspective. Can you talk about those two perspectives a little? You know, what's interesting is um, when you, when, when, from my experience of working uh, with the Latino community specifically, because, you know, of the demographics, that's a lot of the population that I get to serve. Um, we're talking about uh, first or second generation U.S. citizens. Um, we're talking about um, their experience with their fathers who um, sometimes had dual families one in the United States and one in Mexico, um, who were, you know, identified themselves by their work ethic and their hard work, um, that their love language was acts of service and work, providing a roof over your head and, and food and clothes, um, not so much affection, not so much engagement, but all those other tangible things that they could deliver. Um, but also we're seeing another gener this, this next generation of Latino families that we are serving. And it's, it's interesting because uh, as you, I never really thought about it until right now. Um, there's like this dual existence of, um, you have a, a certain population that's kind of um, drawn to the uh, street and gang culture. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have another uh, uh, section that's very much launched into the education part of it, mm -hmm. you know? And so you kind of have this duality that's happening within the same community, um, but that's still your primo and that's still your compa and that's still your cousin, that's still that community, but they're just kind of moving in two different directions. What I'm, what I'm grateful for that as an African-American man, I can move within those spaces, mm -hmm. you know, with safety and be embraced, mm -hmm. you know, um, that we have been able to develop trust equity within our community that um, we are a safe space for fathers to go to. Um, English speaking, Spanish speaking, whatever your, your demographic may be, um, we'll find a way to serve you. So that's kind of what that looks like for our community. Wow. When we were um, writing your introduction, my mind was like, man, this brother does a lot. Like <laughs> you got several different titles and things you do. Give me an overview of what you actually do, because you do a lot. Right. Um, you know, um, from the Merced County, wearing the Merced County hat, um, we have an All Dads Matter Resource Center, which you visited, you know, a few years ago when you came out for a site visit, which is really like a one stop, a safe space for fathers. We get a lot of dads that's, that come in here straight from court. You know, maybe they've been in family court. It didn't turn out like they wanted it. They come over here to get some support and uh, talk about a strategy to how to navigate that system. We get a lot of referrals from child, from a children's services branch. So families that have open CPS cases, mm -hmm. we get those, we get those calls at 11 and 12 o'clock at night when the children have just been detained. Okay. Right. And the father is in a panic. He's traumatized and needs someone to talk to, to get him through the next eight hours so till we can get him in the door. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, we also have men's support groups in English and Spanish in two different locations within our county, um, which are amazing. And I'm sure you're where, you know, you, you can attest to there's something extremely therapeutic about safe space, mm -hmm. safe space for men to to unpack those traumas that are creating barriers to their relationships, including the one that they have with themselves. Um, of course, we do boot camp for new dad workshops, which is a one day, three hour workshop for first time or expecting fathers. Um, we provide support with family court uh, uh, paperwork that needs to be completed. We have a partnership with the uh, Merced County Superior Court Self-Help. What's interesting is that Superior Court Self-Help has no Spanish speaking staff. 
So they mm. sent all their Spanish speakers to us, you know, the <laughs> fathers. And uh, my staff is more than willing to help. We help with uh, child support paperwork as well. Um, we have um, an entire catalog of male engagement activity workshops that we um, facilitate at every Head Start site in the county as a way of inviting fathers into their children's education space in a safe and comfortable way um, by doing things from creating simple recipes to doing artistic things to creating children's stories that they can share with their children. Um, and just really, you know, that's a lot of what I do. Um, aside from, you know, doing the training component piece with UC Davis and Fresno State, and uh, recently, I was um, uh, elected to be the first president of the California State Fatherhood Council. Mm, okay. And so uh, that'll, that's a new nonprofit that we're formulating right now uh, to do some training and do some advocacy work in a co more cohesive way as a state. So wow. um, those are some of the hats that, that I'm wearing right now, man. Yeah, well, I know in your heart it's only one hat. You know, yeah. but when you see it on paper and in a resume, it's like, how is he doing all those things? And we don't count the amount of activities we have to engage in in a given day. To us, it's all one. It's part right. of the core of right. who we are. I want you to talk a little bit about, because I think sometimes when we talk about where fatherhood programs are taking place from, we kind of gloss over when they are taking place within a county. And so... San Bernardino's is also within a county. And one of the things that they struggle with is the thing that I believe you guys strength resides. And that is that you are within a county and you're connected to almost every service you need across the board. So there's a ready-made ecosystem yes. for you to use your strength at an agency. Talk about the benefits of running a fatherhood program within a county. Um, yes, I've, I've often shared the importance, and I hope that we are a model of an effective way to um, host a fatherhood program within a county, which is very unique, because both you and I know that most of this work is done in the nonprofit arena, mm -hmm. you know, and so um, a lot of the things that a lot of the things that nonprofits often struggle with in regards to they have to worry about paper clips to people and everything that falls in between. Um, are automatically built into when you work under a government agency. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you have access to resources and be able to build partnerships with community partners with the strength of an agency behind you. Mm -hmm. And so um, that lends itself in a lot of different ways. One, with credibility, um, longevity. There's no way that we could have been able to last for 20 years uh, without that foundation, mm -hmm. you know. And then um, access so we have access to the community right, right readily, you know, when they come through our doors, whether they're getting, um, you know, services, whether they're coming through the uh, eligibility or welfare to work piece of it, mm -hmm. um, whether it's um, we get to, think, to get to engage directly with children's services, directly with child welfare, communicate directly with social workers um, who um, who uh, have families that uh, whose dads maybe have a, a, a CPS case. Um, Probation works directly with us. So a lot of those barriers that other agents, other entities may have to struggle to get in those doors, we're already in them. Mm -hmm. Now, understand, too, that it can be a double-edged sword as well. And that sometimes someone, I posted something the other day where someone shared with me, um, they were like, how is it that you do innovative work in a bureaucratic system? Mm -hmm. Innovation, bureaucracy is where innovation goes to die, <laughs> <laughs> right? Because you're always kind of boxed in. There are always a lot of overhead. There's a lot of, uh, and um, that can often be a challenge. That's a reality of it. You know, that's often a reality of it. One of the, uh, one of the real realities as well was that when you're, in, when you're housed within a government agency, um, the vision may not always be shared with all entities involved, mm -hmm. you know, um, and there's a lot of hierarchy, you know, and so um, within that hierarchy, um, everyone may not see the same vision with fatherhood as you do. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's kind of stuck within that culture of if we're serving fathers, it must be 
getting them a job. Mm. You know, we got money for that. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But serving fathers and, and supporting with their trauma uh, and this emotional support in dealing with mental health, um, that's not really within our wheelhouse, you know, in the way that we're accustomed to serving fathers. Mm-hmm. Then understanding that within a human services agency, um, it's probably 85, if not more, percent all women that mm-hmm. we work with, you know. And so um, depending on their experience with fathers, depending not only their own father, but maybe the father of their children, they may have different views of what a fatherhood, what, what dads need, mm-hmm. you know? And so, you know, I was just sharing with someone yesterday that um, vision is a form of insanity, <laughs> you know, in a lot of ways. <laughs> and she was like, well, what do you mean? I says, well, sometimes no one can see the vision but you. Right. Right? No one right. can see the vision but you. And so when you're, when you're articulating this vision of what fatherhood looks like, not just now, but as we plan for the next 5, 10, 20 years, um, people think you're crazy. And I'm like, no, that's just, I see it. You know, uh, I mm-hmm. see it. So, mm-hmm. you know, there's, um, there's a lot of um, pros that go with it. But with any purpose, there's always some cons that go with it. Right. You know, if you don't come upon struggles, you may not be living in your purpose. Mm-hmm. You know? Absolutely. It just, just, just kind of comes with it. Mm-hmm. Did you guys struggle with that um, coming to the agency seeking help? What is the pathway into providing services for these dads? Are they, and you know, we don't use the word mandated anymore. We use strongly encouraged, right? Yes. And so, or are they seeing something or hearing from someone? What is the general pathway into those services? Well, we do get referrals from uh, child support. We get referrals from family court. The family court commissioners and the mediators will make that referral for dad right from um, superior court. We work directly with probation. We get a lot of uh, um, referrals coming through probation as well as, um, you know, we're tapped into every agency within our county mm-hmm. and have, they have the option to make those referrals and get those dads in. But, but, uh, but what I'm most proud of, Kenneth, is that our strongest marketing are the dads who've been here. Wow. Yeah. That's our biggest advocates. Those dads who go out there and say, you go, you need to go see all dads matter right away. You need to go there and go to their office. They'll help you with, it. you know, that's where you need to be. And so um, when former clients are doing the referral for you, mm-hmm. you must be doing something right. Right. You know, when I have dads who came to the program 15 years ago through a CPS case, completed their CPS uh, court order, got their children back, got clean, doing all the things they need to do, and then eight years later come back because that kid that was five is now 13. Mm-hmm. And there's a whole new different uh, learning curve that needs to happen mm-hmm. and come back to get more support. Uh, you know, those are the things that tell me that we are doing something right. So because even though we are a government program, a human services agency program, most of our clients are community-based clients. They're mm-hmm. not coming directly from the human services agency. Mm-hmm. And that's a good thing, too, because, you know, again, that's the uniqueness of being a county. Um, right. And that's the uniqueness of not having to, to work so hard to create collaborations because you are embedded in the system. You are part of what everybody else is trying to accomplish embed fatherhood in the normal course of service provision in their cities, states, or wherever. Right. The best place to do that is within the county. And the other thing that's cool about it is I'm sure, um, and I don't want to get too deep in the weeds with respect to where your funding comes from, but I'm going to make the assumption that there's a lot of TANF money involved. And so there's a lot of agencies around the country that are struggling with how to provide services through TANF programming. And to me, it's real easy. You embed fatherhood in your service provision and TANF money will follow if services are following that way. Has that worked for you in terms of not having, because it's in a county, <clears throat> really not having to scratch and claw for funding to do what it is you guys um, 
desire to do for fathers. Yes, absolutely. You know, we are, um, we are, we fall in the employment and training branch, which is welfare to work and Cal works. So all my staff are employment and training workers. That's their title. We are a specialized program under that branch. And so my, my staff carry a very small caseload, um, which allows us to be employment and training um, employees. So all the funding comes from that area. But we also have partnerships with First Five, you know, mm-hmm. and First Five partners with us to do like the Boot Camp for New Dad workshops and providing the diaper bags. You know, we partner with um, with Head Start um, to do the male engagement workshops and provide, you know, the, those supports and services through them. And so there's a there's a fr- there's a few different funding sources, but the majority is Cal Works and um, and um, Welfare to Work. Absolutely. Mm. But ding, 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 right? And because you guys get to do a lot of what I like to describe the preventative work, right? Yes. So the preventative work is in that zero to five space, right? right. It is where um, non-married parents are still romantically involved. Um, they are really trying to do what they desire to do for their children. Uh-huh. Systems have not infiltrated their relationship yet. Um, family support is at its strongest, you know, when babies are the youngest, um, and fathers are more, um, even the research said they're more intimately engaged in not only the raising of their child, but the support of the mothers, you know, as well. And I really believe that it's in that preventative work that then begins to have the biggest impact on the back end which is after five years when there's little contact between non-married men and their children, that it is because of some of the things that's happening in that zero to five year old space that's been unaddressed. Right. Right. And, uh, you're absolutely right. And it's all about prevention and it's all about, um, supporting, um, the relationship between the father, child and the, the, and the mother, you know, it's about, it's about having having dad understand that um, his role does not end. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I'm thinking particularly about you know so a lot of the dads that we work with that are going through like family court mm-hmm. and they're they're struggling for custody. You know, and they come in and it's like um, you know they're, they're 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 like struggling for visits. They're struggling to get some custody of their child, and the number one issue that they're concerned with. The number one thing is someone's taking my child from me. Right. Right. I'm not going to be a father anymore. Right. You know, and the simple comment of you will be your child's father for the rest of your life. And let that land. Is when you see this emotional shift, you know, and and Mm -hmm. that's become very emotional. And Mm -hmm. we can explain and listen, I know things are difficult now. Absolutely, they are. And we want to acknowledge that. But I want you to understand that this time period that you're in now is a snapshot of when you look at the the totality of your relationship with your child. Mm -hmm. There'll be a time 20 years from now when you'll be sitting in your living room with your child and maybe your grandchildren running around. And what you reflect on is, I remember in 2024 when I thought this would never happen. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so yeah. think about the investment that you're putting in now uh, that's going to create those outcomes 20 years from now, yeah. you know, and, and uh, yeah, yeah. That, that's the conversation. Yeah. Words matter. Um, yes, words do. really matter. You know, when you say what you just said, which is, you know, when they lose, when they seemingly lose a court case, they really believe that I can't be a father anymore. You know, and sometimes you have to slow them down and say what you just said, which is you're going to be a father for the rest of your life. Right. Um, if you want to engage in fatherhood, right, which is the act of being a father, right. fighting for your child is one of the acts of being a father. If right. we're talking about fathering, we're talking about now engagement. But right. sometimes you got to continue to be actively engaged in your fatherhood to get to your father ring because your father being a father is a constant reality. That's not changing. 
And so I think when we are able to kind of break terminology down for fathers to kind of help them understand what's happening to them, right, or what's happening in the situation, uh -huh. they have a little more patience in what you're saying because you're absolutely right. I mean, we have fathers come through our program here in Atlanta all the time, and we do these kind of snapshots of, you know, what they look like when they came into the program, yes. and then in the next six weeks, how they're yes. standing up in front of their boys talking about how their life has completely changed right. because their perspective has changed. Their perspective has changed. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely, their perspective has changed, and uh, and then also another piece of that that of that conversation, Kenneth, is getting dads to recognize a win. Mm. You may say you want fifty percent, <laughs> and you go to court and you get twenty percent, mm. but you had zero percent. That's a win. Right. Right. Treat it like a win. Right. Right. And let's build on that. Let's not treat it like a loss. Right. You know, you said you were getting no time with your kid. Right. Now you're with them on Wednesdays from five to seven and then Saturdays from that's a win. Right. You know, let's build on that and let's see it as a win and continue to build on that. Yeah, I thought you was going to another place, which is in addition to what you just said is recognize a win. My thing is also be careful what you ask for. Right. That's so you too. can go in full fledged. I want 50 percent custody of my chill child decision making all that stuff and you walk in and you get it and then the question right. is can you really handle it do you know what that means Am to I have 50 percent custody yes particularly if you're working on a job that is very um not flexible to timing right. and you can't do those things so you have to ask for things in relative proportion to your capability right of being able to be a parent on that level because parenting is more than just you know picking your child up on the weekend you know and hanging out with them in some fun place you know until right. sunday that you drop them off right. those times between monday morning at 7 a.m and friday at, at 8 a.m that's a different kind of parenting that's a different kind of parenting Absolutely. So you're <laughs> right. It's about being realistic about what you're asking for and don't bite off more than you can chew right now. You know, I talked to him about when you when you're asking for percentage of custody, it's not how much time your mother can spend with them. It's not how much time your sister can spend with them. It's right. realistically how much can you as the father be hands on and present in that moment. Right. So, you know, be realistic about it. Don't set yourself up for failures going in. Don't bite off more than you can chew, you know, mm -hmm. and always keep in mind what's best for the child. Right. Right. right? What's yeah. really best for the, for our child, mm -hmm. you know, and we, we talk about you. So you earlier, you talked about language and we talk, we talk about the importance of not my child, but our child mm -hmm. and how that has an effect in a setting like a courtroom when you're talking to a commissioner and using that language. Right. You know, by saying our child deserves this or our child needs that as opposed to, you know, that possessive language of my son or my, my daughter or my baby. Right, you know, right. Yeah. yeah, and you know, an hour to a judge is much louder in their ears when the other parent is saying my. Absolutely. It's almost Absolutely. like in boxing, it's like a counter punch. It's a counter punch, yeah. You don't see that coming. You know, and my thing is like I, I, we spend a lot of time coaching dads on how to be, how to behave in court. Right. You know, so we'll do role plays on what it looks like in court. You know, and we talk to them about the importance of understanding that the feelings and emotions of court we deal with in support group. The business of custody court we deal with in a courtroom. Mm. So you can come yeah. here and tell us how you feel about it. And say whatever you need to say. It's a safe space for that. But that's not where you vent your feelings in a courtroom in front of a family court commissioner. That yeah. never works out. I tell them all that's going to get you is a, a restraining order and 52 weeks of anger management. And that's right. not what you're going there for. And no time with your child. And no time with your child. Yeah. Yeah. So you're doing a um, boot camp, you know, for new dads. Let's talk about these new dads. All these these dads are different, right? They different. So what are you seeing with these new dads? 
You know, um, it's a beautiful thing because um, it, 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 it's interesting because I use the term that, man, um, fatherhood is coming back in style. <laughs> you know, <laughs> in the sense of, uh, um, you know, these, these fathers that we're seeing now are really truly embracing that role. And they, they're embracing the, the power of rewriting the legacy of fatherhood in their families. Mm-hmm. You know, um, as you know, we start the workshop off with two very profound questions. The first question we ask is, give me words to describe your dad. Right? Mm-hmm. And we ask him, give me words to describe your dad. And undoubtedly, every time we ask that question, it gets quiet. Wow. Right? Because if I'd have said, give me words to describe your mom, that's free flowing and they say that instantly. But when I say, give me words to describe your dad, that takes a little more, that's another depth of thinking. And so you give guys, well, he's a hard worker, he's a disciplinarian, or, you know. But inevitably, there's someone who says, well, can I say anything? Mm. I'm like, well, this is your space, absolutely. You know, words to describe your dad. And that's when you might hear, I don't know, I never met him. Mm-hmm. or he was a liar or you know he was abusive or he was an addict or he was an asshole or whatever they say we put it on a huge piece of post-it paper so when mm-hmm. we're done asking that question the second question we ask is now imagine it's 15 years from now and i'm talking to your child and if i ask your child give me words to describe your dad what will your children say Why? Right. and th- that's a beautiful piece Mm-hmm. Because it allows this, this dad who's about to be a father to really think about what do I want my relationship to look like with my child 15 years from now? Mm-hmm. And that's when you hear best dad ever, always there for me, you know, fun, creative, outgoing, you know, um, um, integrity, role model. And what they're really describing is the father they always wish they had. You know, yeah. and we talk about how you can be that father you always wanted by being this father to your child, you know? And so um, they seem to really embrace that. What I love about boot camp is that, like I said, it's open to the public. So it's not uncommon for me to have, you know, a 17 year old veteran father there with his six month old daughter coaching a 32 year old UC Merced professor (laughs) on how to burp a baby. Right, right. (laughs) But there's a beautiful exchange of, of fatherhood and wisdom and community that happens in those environments. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I always say them damn blue pills. You know, that's <laughs> what's, you know, that's what's, because we, we had one, bro, he was, I think he was like late 50s or 60s something, yeah. you know, with uh, his, his son was like six years old or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I'm like, man, you know, y'all need to leave those pills alone, <laughs> right. you know, you know, because these younger, we talk about young dads, these young moms are different too. They are. They're different too. They are. And, um, you know, they making different decisions that aren't societally, um, uh, what's the word? Accountable. Yeah. As it used to be 30, 40 years ago, right? And so a mom can say, you know what? I think you will be the best parent to take care of the child and be okay with, you know, turning over custody and saying, go about your business, especially if you're 60 and she's 30. I'm glad you said that, uh, Kenneth, because that is a dynamic that we're starting to see occur more and more. You know, um, even with young fathers, uh, you know, late teens in their 20s, where, um, you know, they're single dad from the day the child's born. Right. You know, um, right. It's now my responsibility. I'm raising a baby. Right. You know, um, mom has decided that she's not ready for this. She, she, you know, she just has to go do her own thing. You know, right. and, and but what I also can say is they are embracing that role, Kenneth. Right. And, and right. I think that having a place, a space like All Dads Matter, where um, we can support and reinforce these aspirations and also be there when the time gets tough, mm-hmm. because it does get tough, you right. know? So I will right. get that call at one o'clock in the morning, you know, Lamar, I hate to call you so early in the morning, but my baby won't stop crying. <laughs> I'm like, remember the crying baby checklist we went through? Right. <laughs> you know, let's go through the checklist, you right. know? Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and 
we'll find it. You right, know, right. have that support because sometimes Kenneth, that support is not coming from the family. Absolutely. You know, and that's why these, these, um, you know, I say these programs are so vital, but it's more these relationships are more vital. These access points are more vital. Right. It's not so much the program. At, like I said something the other day, um, Lamar, I had never said it before. I was in a conversation and I said it and I was like, whoa, Kenny, where did that come from? And I was like, but it explained a lot in my mind. And I said, there's a difference between providing a service and providing help. Right. Right. Service is limited by the resources, right? So for moms, for the most part, when they walk into a building to get services, they're going to get what they need in services, but they're also going to get help. Help is what you receive beyond the boundaries of services. Right. For fathers, Absolutely. if the services aren't matching their needs, then no one's willing to give them any help. They'll just say, we don't have those services here. We don't have this here. We don't have that there. And they'll send them on their way right. out the door. And I think we have to get more integrative with respect to hiring the right kind of people, creating the right kind of culture Absolutely. that folks are willing to not only provide services for fathers, but to also give them help. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and help from a position of, um, of not seeing you as a deficit, but seeing you as an asset. Right. And the fact that you came in and asked for help tells me everything I need to know about you and your role as being an amazing father. Right. That's all I need to know. I'm here to do that for you. And mm -hmm. I'm very, very blessed to have a team that truly embraces that philosophy, truly mm -hmm. embraces it. There is no off time for us. You know, we live this thing. You know what it is? Right, 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 right. We live in the community where we serve, you know. So mm -hmm. so we run into our families at Walmart. You know, we run mm -hmm. into our families at, at, the, at a school function. Or I, I recall a story one of my staff told me a few months ago. He went to a, a, a barbecue for one of his cousins, which is very much gang affiliated. He walks in, everybody, you know, lace in the same color. You know, and they're giving him the, you know, where you from, the, you know, the, 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 right. the check in. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the gentlemen there said, um, don't you work for All Dads Matter? And he said, yeah. And he's like, you know what? I, I went to All Dads Matter. When my baby was, was going to be born, I went to boot camp. And all of a sudden, all these little touch points start popping up. Oh, I went there too. Oh, I was there. Mm -hmm. I did. I did, went to the group for a while. And the mm -hmm. whole dynamic changed right right the whole dynamic changed and yeah. you talk about a culture and you talk about a brand and how brand is synonymous with a culture that tells me what i need to know you mm -hmm. know about about where we are and how we're serving you know within our community yeah i am sure that your skill set in trauma-informed care is on 10 in terms of utilizing it in dealing with these fathers. Um, I was, we're doing some work um, in West Virginia and in West Virginia, one of the biggest challenges for families there and more specifically for fathers is uh, substance abuse, particularly fentanyl and, and, and uh, meth and all of these other things that are infiltrating these communities. It's also um, a whole new different stuff now, Kenneth, ain't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. And we were talking about, um, they had just done these papers on trauma-informed care. And I, was, I read both of them and we were on a phone call and I said, for me, um, there's a huge hole in these papers. And I said, and that's not that these two papers aren't relevant with respect to what you're talking about. I said, I would suggest that there needs to be a third one because I believe this piece is even more critical than the other two pieces. And I said, that is, there needs to be a descriptor for the unique traumas that fathers go through. And we need to name those traumas. Right. And so if I'm a father who comes in, if I don't, shouldn't have to tell you that I'm depressed or stressed or tell you that I don't have a job or tell you any of these other things that then trigger, oh, well, you just need a job. You just need right. to make some more money. You just right. need to do this. You just right. need to do X. But in that 
description of what I need if I say that I haven't seen my child for the last year, that is a trauma. That's a trauma. That's a trauma. That's a trauma. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Yes. And we have to be able to recognize that and deal with that. So in your work, where are you seeing these things where trauma-informed care is important to be able to utilize? You know, um, I think that trauma-informed care is the, is the bedrock principle for serving fathers. You know, I think that the importance of creating a safe space where they can express their traumas and not feel that they'll be ridiculed or feel that um, they'll be seen as less than or weak um, for expressing their traumas and having a space to do that is critical to the, to the healing process for men and for fathers. Okay. And there are very, very few spaces where men and fathers can get that. I mean, you know that as well as I do, Kenneth. Very, very few spaces. Most of the time, as you share, when they go in and share that, that, these dynamics, um, immediately it's, well, let's get you a job, mm-hmm. right? And traditionally, workforce investments and work nets are the, are, have been the recipients of the fatherhood funding, which shows that that's the priority. Right. My, and my interest is, and, and for so many, they do very well with getting dads a job. Mm-hmm. My question is, what happens 90 days later mm-hmm. when you've never right. addressed the depression, when right. you've never addressed the trauma? How, where is the, how, are they able to retain that job 90 days later, 120 days later, when even though you're making a paycheck, those things that you're not dealing with are dealing with you? Right. Right? Yeah. And it's a stressor even more. And they mm-hmm. end up calling in, calling out, losing that job and being in a worse place position than they were before they start. And and where do they go there? So within our program, we have a state certified drug and alcohol specialist who co-facilitates our groups. We have a licensed clinical social worker, a clinician who not only uh, co-facilitates the groups, but also can provide one-on-one counseling sessions Mm -hmm. to our fathers as an intro into long-term counseling. Okay. It's a safe space. Like you can come into counseling, try it on, see that it's safe. Now let us get you connected to someone who can do this long-term. So Mm. it's a great place for that to happen. Cause you know, I can tell you, Kenneth, and I'm sure that you're aware we're dealing with real dads over here. Right. And, um, um, so dealing with real dads and real families, we got real dad and real dad stories, mm-hmm. you know, right. um, as I think about, you know, someone asked me a, about a couple of weeks ago, so we had just got a recognition at the state level and um, someone said, you must be very proud of this recognition and the things that are happening, you know, with all dads matter. And I shared with her, I said, in all honesty, I'm thinking about the dads that have come through our program that are not here anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, right. Those fathers right. who um, maybe had one foot in the street and one foot out the street, which is right. the most dangerous space to be in, they're right. not here anymore. And what's happening with their children? Right. I'm about the fathers who took their own lives, mm. you know, right. who, as much as we tried to provide the support, as much as we tried to provide the, 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 everything that, that we could provide for them they still succumb to the depression and the trauma and took their own lives. Mm-hmm. You know? um, mm-hmm. That's what I'd be thinking about. <laughs> yeah. You and know? then there's those fathers that just fall off the grid, you no. know, because they either just gave up. Um, they don't see yes. an end in sight. They don't have any hope. And I always say a man with no hope is a dangerous man. It's a dangerous man. And you're, you're absolutely right. It's those, you know, it's those fathers that have been through the program and I'm watching the news at six o'clock and guess right. what I see? Right. Guess what? I know him. Right. I know him. Right. You know what I'm saying? And there's that little bit of a heartbreak there, like, man. Right. He's a good he was a good dude. Right. You know, but he fell back into this and this is where he is now. Right. You know. Yeah. Um, and you like me, we got girls. And so we thinking yes. about that aspect of it, right? We're yes. thinking about like What's the pool going to look like for my babies? Absolutely. 
And it's scary. <laughs> it's <Why>? scary because <laughs> we set high bars. Why? You know, we set high bars. And, um, you know, sometimes that could be very tough in the vetting process for our children and their partners because um, they know what it should feel like to be in safe space. Right. They know what it should, no matter how pretty it is, they know what it should feel like to be in right. that safe space. So, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right with that's concerned. Yeah. Lamar, tell people how they can get in touch with you and learn more about the work you're doing out there in Merced County. They can go to our website at www.alldadsmattermerced.org. You can find us on Facebook under the Merced County Human Services Agency Facebook page. You can give us a call at 209-385-7521 or just come in, 3376 North Highway 59, Suite D in beautiful Merced, California. Yeah, I got to get back out there, bro. It's been a while. I need to see you, put my eyes on you again, see what's going on out that way so we can continue to amplify your work, man. You um, you are a wealth of knowledge, um, and that knowledge needs to be shared, um, and it does need to be amplified around the country, you know, as a um, successful model on how to do this work within counties around the country. And so... I want to be I want I want to be in the Lamar Henderson business in terms of getting that done, you know, and, and, and expanding your bandwidth um, so that people can see uh, what that looks like. In fact, even bringing out some of our, you know, federal clients to see like, you know, because there's a whole new crop. When we came, yes, um, the, only, yeah. the only two people left from the time that we came is me and Patrick. Like yes. nobody else is left. You'll just... actually be here next month. Huh? You'll actually be here next month. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, we're just kind of, you know, trying to figure that whole thing out and, you know, making sure that we continue to tell the story um, that there's always going to be cycles of people that we need to convince all over again, you know, until the culture change and this becomes a part embedded in the system itself. As long as it's not embedded, we're going to have to continue to tell the story over and over and over again, you know, for the new people who come in. And then as they exit, the new people right. come in and they exit, the new people yeah. come in. And it's like, we got to start all over again. It's like a hamster in the wheel, but you know, I don't get tired because I right. know, you know, I know, that at some point, you know, the will will fall apart and people will understand the importance of this work and we'll be able to save more families, you know, through strengthening farms, strengthening fathers. You know, Kenneth, I, gotta, I just wanted to acknowledge you really quick. About three weeks ago, um, you sent me an email out of the blue. Mm. And all it said was, brother, you built for this. Uh. And I want you to know that on that day, the timing was absolutely perfect. Absolutely perfect. That was a divine intervention. Mm. You know, um, it was a heavy day, you know. Um, and it had been heavy for a little while, but, mm -hmm. um, just to receive that message spoke to me and, um, um, I was able to find some moisture in that hope cup to keep, <laughs> it, to keep me going. And yeah. then lastly, you know, there's something that you, that you shared years ago that is like solidifies it for me in regards to these, uh, working with fathers. And it was very, you put it very simply, you said, if you say you're a family services program and you're not serving fathers, you're mm -hmm. not a family service program. Right. Yeah. So that, like, that tells it all. Right. You know, that tells it all. Yeah. If you're not serving fathers as an important component and entity in that family, then you right. are not serving families. Right. And I mean, there's not much more you can say than that. That's a call. That's a call to action right there. <laughs> Yeah, I still use that every now and then. It shocks people. It's like people, like, you can see it in their eyes, like, wait, what did he just say? And I'm like, right. yeah, no, I ain't holding no words back. You're not. You're you not. Know, You're you not. know, be truthful to yourself. Say what, and it's okay if yes. that's what you want to do. Just name it. Just, just name, name it. it. Name it right. And just so name. that these guys, when they walk up, they know what you are. And they right. don't walk in and get discouraged because you said you're one thing, and when you get in there, like I said before, you got no services for them, and you don't want to help them. 
right? Yeah. And you just subscribe and to like really strengthen families. It just makes no sense whatsoever. But man, thank you so much. I love you to death, man. Ain't nothing you could do about it, as my bishop always says to me. Uh, appreciate everything you are and everything that you bring to this space. And like I said, I will find my way back out there again to see what you guys are um, up to in California so we can share that word. And to my I Am That podcast listeners, thank you so much for tuning in another Sunday or whenever you happen to be listening. You know, you ha- you know how I like to leave you. Always, keep, always be kind to others as you're kind to yourself or you might find yourself by yourself. Always shoot high for your goals because even if you miss, you'll be amongst the stars. And as my good friend Art Mitchell and Mitchell used to say to me all the time, it's nice to be important. But you know what? It's much more important to be nice. Until next Sunday, God bless and peace out. Peace out, good people. Thank you so much for taking the time to spend with us. You've been listening to I Am Dad Podcast. We hope that you have been informed, encouraged you to think, or even inspired your heart for the love of dads. The conversation does not end here. Come back and join us next week. Same time, same place. Or you can continue the dialogue on our I Am Dad Facebook page. We also invite you to listen to past episodes, learn more about us, and keep up with special activities by visiting IamDadPodcast.com. That's IamDadPodcast.com. Until next time, I leave you with this reminder of manhood from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. When I was a child... I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Because of this reminder, I will always understand that I am dad, period.